Okay. So there's three main things I want to talk about today. Um, the legislator. Government. And the third topic is a little bit more uh, nebulous, I don't know, but law and freedom <laughs> in Rousseau. Um, um, this I said this is nebulous, but this is actually really important because remember I told you that uh, Kant says somewhere that Rousseau is to morality what Newton is to physics. Um, and it's basically Rousseau's thought about the relationship between law and freedom, I think, that Kant uh, most has in mind when he says that. Um, okay. So, um, oh, any idea of when paper two grades will be released? Uh, no, <laughs> uh, soon. <laughs> um, I don't know. I hope maybe the end of this week, although the next part of this week is going to be pretty busy for me. Um, I'm only grading nine of them, but still, uh, yeah, it might be the beginning of next week. Sorry to say that's as much idea as I currently have. Are there any questions about that or about something like that? Okay. So, um, to, so to understand what the legislator is doing and, um, And by the way, I think maybe better than legislator, a better word for what Rousseau is talking about here would be lawgiver. Um, we're not talking about the legislative um, power of the Commonwealth or something like that. Um, it's going to become clear why in a second. So um, we're talking, it's actually talking about someone who's completely outside the structure, the political structure that we're setting up. Um, so to understand what this legislator or lawgiver is doing, um, I want to first, uh, I guess, one last time talk about the two steps in setting up the you know, I'm going to, by the way, I'm going to keep using the word commonwealth. Uh, Rousseau doesn't have a term that he really settles on for this. Sometimes he calls it republic. Um, but that's confusing because republic can also mean a specific form of government. And sometimes Rousseau means or uses republic to mean that. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to just keep calling it commonwealth, even though Rousseau doesn't use that term, actually. Um, so, uh, right, so I'm going to talk one, one last time about the two steps involved in setting up the Commonwealth. Now, I pointed out last time that Rousseau doesn't have the two steps that Hobbes and Locke have. So the two steps that Hobbes and Locke have are, number one, the decision to unite. And then number two, the choice of the sovereign for Hobbes or the legislative for Locke, right? So is it for Hobbes, it's the choice of the person who is going to do everything, make laws, enforce laws, um, uh, make individual decrees, whatever. That's the sovereign. For a lock, it's the choice of who's going to make the laws. Um, but uh, for Rousseau, 
these two steps are combined because when you form a commonwealth, again, that's not Rousseau's term, but when you form a commonwealth, what you do is that you, I guess you could say, unite as the sovereign. Right, this is, this is super important to always keep in mind when you're reading Rousseau, that the sovereign, I mean, it can be confusing, especially after reading Hobbes. The sovereign is always, according to Rousseau, the body of all the citizens in assembly. There's no alternatives. There's no other uh, way, uh, forms of sovereignty that are legitimate. Um, so, um, so these two steps are combined for Rousseau because as soon as we decide um, unanimously that we're going to be a commonwealth, we've decided to be the sovereign. Um, but there is another step according to Rousseau that comes after this, which is legislation, or I guess I should say, you know, to begin with, the fundamental legislation. Um, because according to Rousseau, uh, the reasons I'm going to go into more detail about a little later, um, according to Rousseau, the Commonwealth isn't ready to go yet until certain laws are passed. Whereas according to Hobbes and Rousseau, the Commonwealth is ready to go when you finish these two steps. Um, right, so as Rousseau says, this is book two, chapter six, and it's on page 178. Um, It's the first paragraph of chapter six. Through the social compact, we have given existence and life to the body politic. It is now a matter of giving it movement and will through legislation. Right, there's another step that has to be taken. Certain laws have to be made before you have a body politic. That's another word that Rousseau sometimes uses for what I'm calling the commonwealth, or phrase that he uses for it. Um, okay, so before we're ready to, to get going, we need to make certain laws, certain fundamental laws. Now, who is going to make the laws? Well, in one sense, the answer is obvious. The sovereign, that is, the people assembled, are going to make these laws. Again, there's no alternative arrangement, according to Rousseau, that's legitimate. Um, he does sometimes mention a possibility of a kind of interim authority making laws but they, they don't become laws until the people can meet again, and if they want to, veto them. So it's really, again, it's really the assembly of all the people that make the laws. So, um, but in another sense, that's not a good answer, because um, a whole bunch of people getting together can't just make laws someone has to suggest some laws for them to vote yes or no on. Now, I mentioned before, I think I said before that none of these people talk about this, and I don't know how I could have forgotten that, of course, Rousseau does talk about it, and this is where he talks about it, although his answer maybe is not very practical. And it's, I mean, he doesn't give a general answer to it, just about at the very beginning of the Commonwealth. But he does, at least in this situation, address this question, you know, okay, so the laws are going to be made by majority vote, but who's going to bring laws to the floor to be voted on? Where are they going to come from? 
So that's why Rousseau says we need a legislator or lawgiver, someone who is going to write up some fundamental laws for our commonwealth and say, uh, okay, guys, what do you think about these laws? <laughs> and then everyone can vote on them. So the model for this, of course, as usual, is Lycurgus, the lawgiver of Sparta. But he also mentions three other examples, Moses, Muhammad, and Calvin as the lawgiver of Geneva. Um, Professor, would Thomas Jefferson be the lawgiver of uh, the United States? Maybe. I'm not sure exactly. I mean, Thomas Jefferson didn't single-handedly write the Constitution, but... Uh, oh, we're yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know what Rousseau would think. But, of course, the United States is not a, le a legitimate commonwealth from Rousseau's point of view because the people uh, have never assembled to vote on anything. Um, now, you might say, how could that be possible with so many people? And Rousseau will say, exactly, that's why you shouldn't have such big commonwealths. Stay small like Geneva or Athens or whatever. Yeah, anyway, um, um, although, I mean, you know, in other contexts, he definitely is willing to loosen that, right? When he says Muhammad is the lawgiver whose laws have ruled half the earth for, for 10 centuries. Um, obviously, he doesn't mean that there's, there's some specific city-state that he gave laws to. Right? So I, I don't know. I don't. Maybe he would say that about Thomas Jefferson. Who knows? In any case, um, um, Rousseau says a lot of things about the qualifications for being a lawgiver in this sense. And uh, the list of qualifications adds up to it's really difficult to find someone who's qualified to do it. But, you know, that's okay because Rousseau doesn't think that this has been done very well most times. <laughs> so that pretty much fits his theory. Um, the, I guess I would say the main important thing to understand about the legislator um, is uh, that the legislator is not, or at least should not be, either the sovereign. I mean, it can't really be the sovereign, according to Rousseau, because at least in a well-constituted commonwealth, again, the sovereign is the assembly of all the people, and that, they, you know, that many people can't do something like this. Rousseau seems to think that really only one person can do it well. Um, so anyway, the legislator is not the sovereign, and the legislator is not the prince. The legislator has no executive power. All the legislator can do is propose these laws to the citizens to vote on. And Rousseau says that many times it's a good idea to find someone from somewhere else to do this, right? Who's never going to be part of your commonwealth. Um, so, I mean, the reason I say it's important, at least it's important if you think about this section at all, because, or this chapter at all, because otherwise, if you forget that, it's easy to start thinking that he's describing the legislator as this like super powerful figure that stands behind the scenes and controls everything. But actually the legislator has no power at all and isn't even necessarily going to stay there. Um, I guess, uh, I mean, there are some other interesting things about it since these, the other two points I'm going to talk about are more important. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. The, the, I think the other really interesting point, which you can gather from Rousseau's list of legislators, um, but which he also discusses directly, is that the legislator oftentimes is a religious figure. Somehow religion figures in this uh, 
who is figured twice in two different ways. That's confusing. But anyway, somehow religion gets involved in this process. Um, so what he says about that is really interesting, but since uh, we're going to talk more about what he says about religion next time, I'm going to go into it then rather than now. Um, the other thing I want to say before I go on from discussing the legislator is that in addition to these qualifications, this is really, I guess, in a sense, a different topic, but um, in addition to these qualifications on the person who's going to be the legislator, there's also, according to Rousseau, all kinds of complicated requirements that the people and their territory have to make or else it won't be a good time to do this and it won't work. Um, right? Like, so for example, in uh, book two, chapter eight, on page 184, he says, um, and let's see. Yeah, this is the first main paragraph on page 184, right near the top. Um, a thousand nations have achieved brilliant earthly success that could never have abided good laws. And even those that could have would have been able to have done so for a very short period of their entire existence. Peoples like men are docile. So docile means teachable. That's actually like kind of literally what it means, right? It's related to doctor, which means leader or teacher. Um, uh, so anyway, um, peoples like men are docile only in their youth. So, right, he's saying that, like, if a, if a person like this doesn't come along at the right stage in the development of this people, then it will be too late. They'll be set in their ways, they'll be too rich, they'll be too unequal, all kinds of things will have gone wrong. Um, um, now, I mean, he goes on right after that passage, however, to add that um, it's in the youth of the nation, but not in its infancy. So it's actually, if the legislator tries to do this too early, it also won't work. There's a time when the people has reached maturity at which it's able to be it becomes able to understand laws and is still able to be taught by the legislator what the good laws are. So, um, um, so basically, you know, his view is that uh, there's a correct way to set up a government to set up a, well, there's a correct way to set up a commonwealth. Um, I mean, there's different correct ways depending on what the situation is exactly, but all the correct ways have in common this uh, um, sovereignty of the whole assembly of the people. Um, and added to that have to be some other good laws that a wise lawgiver has come up with. And uh, most peoples, most of the time, are not ready for that. So they can't have a good system. It's either too early or too late. Now, um, of course, we all know how much trouble has come out of that idea. <laughs> right? The question of whether a certain people is ready for... Um, ready to govern themselves or not, um, or whether it's too late and they never will be. Um, that, you know, versions of that idea were basically what was used to justify colonialism. Um, uh, on the other hand, of course, just because it caused trouble doesn't necessarily mean it's false exactly, but... <laughs> Um, in any case, that's why I wanted to call attention to that, the fact that Rousseau is saying that here. I mean, you know, like, uh, 
Um, Locke and Hobbes don't really say that. Um, Professor? Yes. So, when you're, what you just quoted is about the person that is presenting legislation laws, or is this the Commonwealth that decides on it? No, right? It's not the Commonwealth because um, it's the person who's proposing the law. So it's like the community or the people have to be willing to accept the person into their now system. Well, they, they have to be ready to, so you need a lawgiver. You need a lawgiver who will look into the particular conditions of this people and see what form of government would be best for them. But the people have to be ready to um to you know form an assembly so it is one individual person yeah that's what Locke seems to think that at least it in the best case it will be one individual person he mentions an example in the history of Rome where they had a commission of 10 people who were supposed to do this well they also had certain executive powers and anyway it didn't go well <laughs> But I, you know, I think he, like Descartes, he thinks that that you know something perfect can really only be set up by a single person. That as soon as you have a committee, it's going to be kind of like, you know, well, you know what they say about committees. Um, oh, wait, Locke thinks that or Rousseau. Locke doesn't talk about this office of the legislator. Okay. Because you just, I think maybe you said, I was talking about like, you said unit as the one person that's presenting the laws. And then I think you said law does say that. So I'm just wondering, is it, oh, is it no? No, what I said, I think, are you talking about what I said before you asked the first question? So the last thing I said was that Rousseau says that there's a time in the history of a people when it's capable of... Um, you know, forming a legitimate commonwealth and accept and, and accepting good laws. Um, but like most people's most of the time are not at that stage. So I, like Locke and Hobbes don't really say that. They don't say that. But Rousseau, I mean, we saw something like this in the discourse on inequality too. Right? He's very focused on the idea that there's, you know, there's a best time and there's a um, there's a worse time and, you know, there's a, there's a development. Um, so of course in the discourse in inequality, there was like a time you reached maturity by then you were already on the path to bad things. But as I at least suggested before here in the social contract, he's imagining a different way things could go. If you just happen to reach maturity under the right conditions and there was a lawgiver like, like Kyrgyz right there. <laughs> then you could form one of these legitimate commonwealths and then it would be better than the state of nature. Um, you're still looking confused. I think maybe I'm skipping from one thing to another. Have I answered your basic question yet? Um, it is one individual person that you're speaking about, right? That under the umbrella of you so and so I think maybe uh, that's yeah, yeah. This is one individual person, or it sh or it, it should be anyway, one individual person. But it's got to be an amazing person, resources. Both in ter not just in terms of like being really smart, but they have to have a weird combination of like really caring about what happens to these people, but at the same time having no like personal attachment to them. <laughs> It's like a very weird mindset this lawgiver has to have. Um, so in any case, you know, what happens if a legitimate commonwealth is impossible because the, the people, you know, the people we're talking about are not at a suitable stage. And I mean, he says this in one particular case, but I think it's his general answer Henceforward, a master is needed, not a liberator. Right? If, like, if you can't have a legitimate state, meaning that you won't be slaves under a master, but will be free citizens ruling yourselves, then 
um, what's going to happen? Master sounds a lot like a dictator. Yeah, right. But I mean, it's master, you know, I mean, it's like Hobbes, right? Hobbes says the sovereign, the way the sovereign rules over subjects is the same way that a master rules over slaves. He calls them servants, but what most people call slaves, right? The, the uh, um, despotical dominion. So, whereas Locke says, no, this is completely different. And Rousseau says, well, yes, Locke, it's completely different. Like true political, legitimate political rule is nothing like the rule of a master over slaves. But uh, most of the time we can't have legitimate political rule. And in that case, um, Hobbes is right. To keep people in line, you need a master. Um, so his, you know, like, um, I mean, I, I think actually that one fact shows all the better what, how, you know, like backs up what I'm claiming about how the discourse and the social contract don't really contradict each other. The discourse is really negative on political or civil society, um, because the discourse is talking about what almost always will happen, according to Rousseau. And is, is it better than the state of nature? No, we would have been better off in the state of nature, but it's too late to go back. Whereas the social contract is talking about special circumstances, almost incredible circumstances under, un, under which something actually better can happen. Oh yeah, now Alvaro, thank you. I've already quoted more of the context. Um, like I said, there Rousseau is talking about a special case where, like, it's the question is whether this people can get back their good laws after having lost them or something like that. But, but this, but he, I, I believe he thinks the same thing is true in general about any people that's not ready to form a legitimate commonwealth. Okay, are there more questions about that? Would he believe that an illegitimate commonwealth is better than being in the state of nature? Well, no, not that it's better than being in the state of nature. Wait, is that Cameron is asking the question? Yeah. Okay. Because um, I also saw you have your hand up. All right. Um, well, I mean, it's not better than the state of nature, right? That's, again, I think is the question he answered in the discourse on inequality. It's not better than the state of nature. If you had the option to stay in the state of nature, or even better in that savage state, right, which he said was, was actually kind of better than the original state of nature, if you had the option to stay there, you should. Right, and in the Discourse on Inequality, he compares it to, like, if you could pick an age to, to stay at, a lot of you are not old enough to have this issue yet. <laughs> but, uh, but believe me, there will come a time when someone will ask you, you know, at what age would you have stopped if you could have? And you'll say, oh, you know, 25, whatever, right? So, but you couldn't, you know, things went on. So Rousseau is saying, it's like, it's the same thing. Like, if you could choose to stay in the savage state forever, um that would be better. But now that we're in this situation, there's no way back to it, right? What's going to happen instead is the kind of war of all against all that Hobbes thinks characterizes the state of nature. And that's why I think he's saying here, you know, and I he doesn't exactly say this in the discourse because he's answering a different question. But I think what he's saying here is, yeah, if you find yourself in this state that can't be reformed along proper lines, um, you can't return to the true state of nature. And yeah, you don't want the chaos that will arise if there is no authority at all. So you're going to have to acquiesce to having a master instead of um, um, a political society. Did, did that answer your question, Cameron? Yeah. Okay. All right, so now I'm going to go on to talk about the government. Yeah. 
This is not the kind of philosophy class where the next topic could be just the. <laughs> now I'll talk about the. All right, anyway. Um, okay, so the fundamental thing that that legislation must do, right? Remember, I guess, of course, I erased it, but like the two steps are, according to Rousseau, first, everyone agrees to become the sovereign of the new commonwealth, and then there's certain fundamental legislation that has to go through. So what the legislation must, that legislation has to do um, is set up the government, what Rousseau calls the government. He also, from a different point of view, calls it the prince. Um, again, like the sovereign, the, the terminology of the prince can be misleading, possibly even more misleading. Normally, Except in a monarchy, well, actually Rousseau says monarchy is the most common alternative. But in any case, normally, except in a monarchy, the prince is like is itself a corporate body. It has many members. It's not necessarily one person. That's part of what the fundamental legislation is going to have to decide. How many people will make up the government? Um, and how will it be internally structured? That is, how will it keep order within itself? Um, okay, so to understand what the government is and why, according to Rousseau, you can't really, even for a moment, have a commonwealth without a government. Um, let me go back to what I didn't really emphasize enough before, which is the distinction Rousseau makes between the sovereign and the state. So, um, let me first read what he says about it. This is book one, chapter six on page 165. Um. Um. This public person formed thus by the union of all the others formerly took the name city. Right, so, you know, as Hobbes and Locke did, he's connecting his topic to the ancient topic of politics. Right, he's saying this used, this is what I'm talking about used to be called the civitas or the polis. And um, so uh, this was formerly called city and at present takes the name republic or body politic. So, so far, those are, like I said, those are all names for what the other people call the commonwealth, the incorporated body of the people. But now he adds his own terminology, which is called state by its members when it is passive, sovereign when it is active. And then skipping this, as for the associates, they collectively take the name people Individually, they are called citizens insofar as they are participants in the sovereign authority and subjects insofar as they are subjected to the laws of the state. So, um, so there's actually two distinctions that are being introduced here, but they, they go together. The state is composed of subjects and the sovereign is composed of citizens. And what's confusing about these distinctions and um, makes it extra confusing to read what he says about government is that these are distinctions between the exact same thing. <laughs> Looked at two different ways. So both the sovereign and the state are the body of all the people. 
Um, and the people are, the body of all the people is the body of all the citizens, and it's also the body of all the subjects. There's really only one big group of people here. But uh, as Rousseau says in the quote I just read, it's called the sovereign insofar as it's active, and the state insofar as it's passive. So basically what this means is that um, what active means here Um, active means like something acts on something else when it contains the principle that that other thing has to conform to, basically. That's like an abstract definition of action. It comes from Aristotle. It's used in important ways by Leibniz and a lot of other people. And I think as it work in Rousseau here also, it's like you can think of it this way, like when a fire heats water, the fire is active and the water is passive because the fire contains the principle of heat in itself and the water has to conform to it, so to speak. <laughs> That's the way Aristotelians think about heating. Now, I mean, Rousseau is not an Aristotelian and, you know, I mean, I don't, he doesn't think about physics that much uh, usually. I guess and that's probably not true. He thinks about everything, but um, physics isn't his main interest. Um, so, uh, but he, I think he is thinking of it that way in this case. So the, the, the commonwealth, the body of the people, qua sovereign, contains in itself or um, makes the principle to which the same group of people have to conform. And that principle is the law or laws. Right, so it's like the sovereign, um, um, you know, uh, contains this uh, law heat, so to speak, <laughs> and the the state or the subjects um, have to like conform to it, have to be legal. That's the relationship between the people and themselves that makes this into a commonwealth. Now remember, he says the social contract is really a contract between the people and themselves looked at two different ways. That's what's going on here. Are there questions about that before I go on? It's both an abstract thing and I made it even more abstract. I'm sorry, that's what I do when I try to, to explain things, <laughs> right? I tried to explain this on a level where you could see that it's the same as, as fire heating water, according to Aristotle. I mean, you know, for me, that's actually, and for understanding how this goes through Kant and how he compares it to Leibniz and whatever, that's really important. But if you just forget about that, maybe it would be a little bit clearer. If I just say the sovereign is the commonwealth as giving laws and the state is the commonwealth as um, being subjected to laws, being required to follow laws. Um, right, so the sovereign citizens are imposing upon the law, upon the state slash subjects. Right. The so and, but what they're imposing is something specific. They're imposing a law or laws. They're giving them laws that they have to conform to. Um... Um, but, see, I mean, that's what's important and requires a government is that 
the sovereign can only impose laws on the subjects. And this is the same topic that had people confused last week, so I'm going to come back to it again, and maybe it'll be clearer now. The, the subjects or the, the, the state that they make up has only promised to obey the sovereign insofar as the sovereign makes laws. Um, that is, and this is where, I mean, this thing that we already saw in Locke's definition of law becomes so important to understand what Rousseau is doing. Only insofar as it gives commands that are applicable to everyone in general, not with respect to any particular person. And basically, it's like the citizens as a whole only have a right to command the subjects as a whole. And their right to command derives from the fact that they're commanding themselves. But they have to command all of themselves, <laughs> right? That is, the command has to be addressed to the same body that is, um, that is commanding it. Whereas if the citizens try to um, give a command that referred to some particular person, and as I said really quickly at the, at the end last time, right, this, or at the end of the extra questions part last time, right, this is what in our Constitution, in the U.S. Constitution, is called a bill of attainder, right? Like if Congress passed a law saying Abe Stone should go to jail for two years, that would be unconstitutional, right? So if the citizens pass a law that refers to individual people, so in that case, it's no longer them you know, giving commands to themselves. It's basically like all of them ganging up on this one person. <laughs> right, or Rousseau says this situation would divide the people into two parts, the big part, because <laughs> remember, they're giving this command by majority vote, right? The big part and the little part, which is consists of this one person. And now, rather than being free, this person is subject to a terribly powerful master. Everyone else ganged up against them. So the problem of um, uniting our forces while not giving away any of our liberty has not been solved if we let this happen. Right? This means everyone is, like, constantly in danger of facing the united force of everyone else against them. And again, the way to avoid that is supposed to be that we only let the sovereign give a command to the state. And only about the state, I guess. I'm kind of mixing those two things together, whereas they're not exactly the same, right? It's, it's not only that it it can't be a command to a particular person. It can't be a command concerning a particular person or a particular case, right? It can't be like everyone who sees Abe Stone should give him a donut. <laughs> that would be, right? That, however much I might like that law, that would not be one of the laws that Rousseau says the sovereign can pass because it refers to an individual. Um, what would Rousseau say about laws passed that target specific groups of people would you view it as similar to laws passed that target individual people? Well, I'm going to, I'm, I'm about to get to what he says about that. So just hold on one second and I'll read what he says about that. So, but first I wanted to read this, is, which is where he says what I was just saying. Um, this is on page 179. So it's still in book two, chapter six. And... It's the one, two, three, fourth paragraph on page 179. Um, no, it's not. Wait. Oh, no. It's this. It's the second paragraph on page 179. But when the entire populace enacts a statute concerning the entire populace, 
It considers only itself, and if in that case a relationship is formed, it is between the entire object seen from one perspective and the entire object seen from another without any division of the whole. Right? So as long as the body of the citizens only makes laws that refers to the whole body of the subjects, um, it can't gang up against anyone. So everyone is free. Everyone is ruling themselves collectively. So laws all have to be general. Now, and to help understand this, and this is also the part that, as I promised, would answer Vanessa's question, um, Rousseau gives a list of examples of how this can work. This is the next paragraph on page 179, third paragraph on page 179. Um, Thus the law can perfectly well enact a statute to the effect that there be privileges, but it cannot bestow them by name on anyone. The law can create several classes of citizens and even stipulate the qualifications that determine membership in these classes, but it cannot name specific persons to be admitted to them. It can establish a royal government and a hereditary line of succession, but it cannot elect a king or name a royal family. Right, so, um, so the answer as far as it goes, and it does definitely leave some questions over, but the answer as far as it goes is that the citizens can pass laws that refer to groups of people, but it has to refer to them by general characteristics, not by mentioning anyone in particular. Right, so it can say, you know, everyone who manages to pull this sword out of this stone uh, will be king, <laughs> or I guess the first one who can do it will be the king, or whatever, right? So that doesn't name any specific person. It just gives a qualification, right? That's what I was about to get to. That makes it sound like he would not have a problem with institutionalized racism. So, I mean, I think the best that can be said about it, um, from this point of view, based on this passage, is that um, he doesn't address that type of issue here, right? So whatever it is that this, uh, I mean, or I guess I should say, he doesn't say what kind of general qualifications are good and what kind are not. Like, um, I mean, you know, anything could be treated as a general qualification. So what if, like I said, instead of whoever pull, first pulls this sword out of the stone, if I say whoever is standing in place X at noon on such and such a day, you know, and the day is the, the, day, is the day when they're voting on these laws and I'm standing there, <laughs> right? So, like, um, uh, in other words, it seems like certain qualifications are still ways that everyone can, that the majority can gang up on a minority. But the, the, this, just putting it that way, doesn't exactly solve the problem. Um, so um, whether Rousseau thinks that is a problem, I think, I mean, he talks about related things in various places, but I think it's kind of ambiguous in the end. Um, I mean, you can see from some of the things he says about different peoples here, it, like a lot of people, both in ancient times and in this period, he, he thinks of race more in terms of climate than in terms of like what we would call genetics. Um, like people who live in a climate that's too hot or too cold are not able to form a good commonwealth. Um, um, so, uh, you know, he's willing to say things like that. And remember, that implies that they're, you know, that they should be put under a master, <laughs> right? So, you know, 
But then again, if those people move to a better climate, you know, their descendants, I, he doesn't say anything that would make me think that he would be in favor of that. So, I don't know. He's like Rousseau personally is a complicated person. I guess like a better question is more like, is there any way, won't this solution always leave problems like that? Where whatever particular way I want to gang up on people is I can uh, phrase it to look like a general qualification that anyone can meet. Uh, Samantha has a question. Is Rousseau thinking that everyone's conditions in the Commonwealth is exactly equal? Well, no, because he's saying that, you know, um, although this particular thing, he it turns out he thinks is a bad idea. He's, you know, they can create a hereditary aristocracy if they want. They just can't say who are going to be the lords, right? They have to establish qualifications. Like maybe there's a civil service exam and whoever takes it becomes a hereditary duke. I don't know what the qualification will be. But like I said, so the, the question is, can't we always phrase whatever we want in a, in a way that makes it sound like a general qualification. Just like, as I mentioned before, Congress, it turns out, can sometimes, you know, adjust the tax code so as to give a particular person a tax break. If they put it in enough qualifications, right? So, um, I mean, I, I don't know whether Rousseau can solve this or not. I think it's interesting that the problem is interesting because it's parallel to, um, not by coincidence, to a problem that people raise about Kantian ethics as well. Whereas if you know anything about Kantian ethics, you know that the principle of it is that um, um, you should act according to a maxim which you could will sh should become universal law. And so the question always is, you know, um, can't I always put, so like what I want is for like me to be able to steal from other people, but them not to be able to steal from me. But that's not a universal law, so it's not moral according to Kant. But can I adjust the law and say, well, people wearing a pink shirt on, you know, uh, Tuesday evening, you know, can steal from other people. And then it's a universal law. <laughs> right. So that's basically exactly the same question moved from Rousseau's politics to Kant's ethical theory, which is based on, or which takes some inspiration from Rousseau's politics. Um, okay. So those are good questions. I mean, in answer to Samantha's question, by the way, Rousseau does think it's dangerous for people in the Commonwealth to be too unequal. Um, right? He says that if, you know, if anyone becomes rich enough that they can buy someone else or poor enough that they're forced to sell themselves, then it's too unequal and the Commonwealth will uh, be destroyed or be corrupted. You know, he has qualifications like that. So, I mean, like he doesn't think it's a good idea to have big inequalities, but it's like this, he does admit that this doesn't prevent it. Okay, but any case, what I'm getting to here is um, given this fact about the way the sovereign can act, um, the sovereign can't carry out the laws, can't enforce the laws, um, can't adjudicate cases under the laws. Those are all things that, of course, have to refer to individual cases, right? If I make a law that says no one should drive more than 65 miles an hour, um, then to enforce the law, someone has to come along and say, X drove 70 miles an hour and therefore they violated the law. But the sovereign can't say that because the sovereign can't talk about individuals. The sovereign, in brief, the sovereign can't execute the law, right? So the executive power can't be in the same place as the legislative power. In a way, it can, and I'll get back to that. But but strictly speaking, it can't possibly be in the same place. 
So um, there has to be something else. And this is what Rousseau calls the government that mediates between the sovereign and the state. Now, I mean, it's weird because it mediates. That means it mediates between the people and themselves. This actually is the place to start thinking not so much about Kant as about Hegel, but uh, I, I, I won't get into that. But any, I mean, in any case, that's, that's what the government is doing here. It's, it's weird that you need something to do this. But you do need something to do it because the, um, um, the sovereign can only give a command to the subject as a whole in general. But a command is no good if it can't be carried out in particular cases. So there has to be something, there has to be a minister to the sovereign. Someone who acts on behalf of the sovereign to, in, I mean, enforce the law, as I, I keep trying to kind of point out that it's not just a matter of enforcement. The, like, you know, various things have to be done according to the law, I guess. You know, like if the law establishes a postal service, um, well, then, you know, someone has to be appointed to run the postal service and you have to decide on the stamp rates and like whatever. Well, maybe that last one could be done by legislation, but, you know, like all kinds of particular decisions have to be made. And all of that is going to be done by the government. Um, and that's why, again, you don't really have a commonwealth until this fundamental act of legislation goes through that says what the form of government will be. Because with no government, you just have a bunch of people saying, wouldn't it be nice if we all did X? <laughs> right? But you don't have any means of getting that carried out. Um, by the way, I guess I should mention, because I don't know if I'm going to come back to it later, that according to that, that uh, this two-step process in Rousseau, right, which I now can put this way, like become the sovereign and then choose the government. So, like, um, this is kind of similar. I mean, it's, again, it's actually really different, but it's kind of similar to the two steps in Hobbes and Rousseau. But beyond the differences they already mentioned, another difference is that um, according to Hobbes and Locke's two-step process, the second step is irreversible, and it's the end of the people acting together, right? So, like, according to Hobbes, we all get together and say, hey, let's unite to form a commonwealth. That has to be unanimous. And then there is one vote that we take. Well, I mean, it might be a little more complicated. But basically, there's basically, like, one short series of votes that we take that determine who will be the sovereign. What will be the law of succession? We might also have to determine, you know. Actually, no, according to Hobbes, the sovereign chooses. The, yeah, no, all we have to do, according to Hobbes, is choose the sovereign. And then once we do that, we never do anything as an assembled people again. Um, or rather, we keep doing things as an assembled people, but only through our representative, the sovereign, <laughs> right? So, whereas according to Rousseau, um, the sovereign, the, pe the assembly of the people remains in existence and makes new laws. The government can't make new laws, can only administer them, execute them. And moreover, if at any time the sovereign decides that this form of government is no good, the sovereign can get together and say, hey, you know, we're a monarchy, but from now on we're an aristocracy. 
Um, so there's no permanence to this step, according to Rousseau. Um, okay, but in any case, like, forgetting about that now. So um, again, as we know, according to Rousseau, there's only one form of sovereignty, popular sovereignty. But there's many different possible forms of government. So, like, when Rousseau makes a distinction between monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy, right, in, for Hobbes, those are distinctions between who is the sovereign. Is it one person, an assembly of person, or the assembly of everyone? For, for Locke, that's a decision between what will the legislative be like? Who will make the laws? Will it be one person or a bunch of people or everyone? For Rousseau, um, the answer to those questions, who's the sovereign and who makes the laws, is always everyone. So in that sense, every legitimate commonwealth is a um, radical democracy. And when he makes a distinction between monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy, he's distinguishing what, how many people are in the government. Um, and like I said, there's also further distinctions to make within the government, since the government itself is a corporate body. And it's interesting to, to think why Hobbes can't admit this. I think I understand, but I'm not going to go into it. Anyway, Rousseau says, since the government itself is a corporate body, it also needs to organize itself to keep uh, order within itself. Or at least it can. Right? So, like, we can say there's 100 people make up the government, and they all have to vote on everything, by majority, or we can say 100 people make up the government and they elect 10 people to tell them what to do and then they, you know, like it could be a much more complicated structure. So there's actually like many, many different types of government we could have according to Rousseau. And which one is best, he keeps emphasizing over and over, depends on the circumstances. Um, he has some really specific things to say about how it depends on the circumstances, some kind of quasi-mathematical things about like when the state is bigger, the government should be smaller and whatever. Um, but also he has some vaguer things to be to say about it. Uh, okay, there's a new question from Vanessa. You said that according to Rousseau, step one and two happen simultaneously. No, oh, I see what's confusing you. So they unite and become the sovereign in the first step and then choose. All right. So what I said was, again, I don't know, maybe I should think of a less confusing way to say this, but according to Rousseau, the two steps of Hobbes and Locke, according to Rousseau, happen simultaneously. Because again, the two steps of Hobbes and Locke are first we decide we're going to have a sovereign, put it that way. And then we decide who the sovereign will be. But according to Rousseau, there's no choice about who will be the sovereign. If we're going to have a sovereign, we have to be the sovereign. There's no other legitimate choice. So these two steps are combined together. But then, unlike for Hobbes or Locke, for Rousseau, once we've chosen the sovereign, we're still not ready to have a commonwealth because we don't have any means for executing the laws that the sovereign's going to make. So we have to make a fundamental law, first of all, and that's Rousseau's second step. So um, now, I mean, you might ask, wait, wait, hold, you should ask, wait, wait, hold on a second. Isn't there an execution of this law that has to happen? How is the sovereign going to choose the specific people who are going to be in the, in the government to begin with? And stay tuned because Rousseau is going to, like, Rousseau regards that as a really difficult problem and he's going to say a lot about it. I'm reading next, for next time. But, um, but in any case, if we ignore that for the moment, so... Um, 
Um, right, so now, what time is it? Should I say... I guess I'll say a little bit about what he says about the three main forms of government. Although, again, he thinks there's many different mixtures and subforms and whatever that you can have, right? So the three main forms, again, as usual, are democracy, aristocracy, and monarchy. But these don't, again, they don't exactly mean what we normally think of them as meaning. Because in some sense, every commonwealth he's talking about is a democracy. And a, a pure democracy. Right? So, like, every time we need to make a new law, everyone has to vote on it. Or at least everyone has to be able to vote on it. He doesn't address that thing that Locke mentions about what if someone's sick or whatever. But, um, right, so everyone at least has to have the opportunity to vote on it. Um, although I think in Rome and Athens, uh, I, I don't think you could just choose not to attend the assembly. I shouldn't say this because I'm not sure. But I think, you know, it was more like jury duty than, you know, like what we call an election. You had to show up. <laughs> that was part of your duty as a citizen. But anyway, so um, so uh, the question is, like, who's going to enforce the laws, uh, judge cases, you know, carry things out in detail, etc. And in a democracy, the answer is still everyone together by majority vote. So, um, you know, like if we want to make a law that says that everyone who drives over 65 miles an hour has to pay a fine, we all get together and vote on that law. And then, you know, um, if I get pulled over for being driving over 65 miles an hour, we all have to get together and vote on whether I, you know, violated the law and have to pay a fine. <laughs> Um, so, uh, um, you know, um, if we're going to have a postal system, we all get together and decide general laws for a postal system. Now, you know, we want to hire a new mail carrier for route number 176. We all have to get together and hire the postal carrier. <laughs> we are the government. Um, so, uh. Obviously, this is a little bit impractical or very impractical. Um, and uh, I mean, Rousseau, like everyone else, points that out. Uh, you know, maybe I'm not going to just read where he says that, but he, you know, he points out it's just, it's impossible for the people to constantly be assembled to be decision, deciding about every day to day matter. Right? Like, there, you know, I would never get a fine for driving over 65 miles an hour because I would never get to go anywhere. I'd spend all day sitting in the assembly of the people. <laughs> um, so, um, so, and so Rousseau says, actually, strictly speaking, there's never been a pure democracy. There's always some mixture. But, um, but he has, I guess I would say, a more, more fundamental or more theoretical problem with this system as well. Because he says, um, which I guess would apply to, to, to some mixed systems that are close to it as well. Because he says, it's just not good to have the same people making the laws and enforcing them. They're going to start to make laws that favor their private interest. Now, what do you, maybe this is a way that he's somehow addressing, doesn't seem sufficient. Anyway, what does it mean that they're going to favor their private interests? We're talking about everyone here, right? But it's ruled by majority. So, like, you know, I mean, um, uh, if we're going to, 
wait, what is the issue here? This is the way he puts it. Maybe I should read it from inside. Because it turns out it's actually a little bit hard to interpret. It's in uh, Book 3, Chapter 8. And it's on the uh, bottom of page 198. It is not good for one who makes the laws to execute them nor for the body of the people to turn its attention away from general perspectives in order to give it to particular objects. Nothing is more dangerous than the influence of private interests on public affairs, and the abuse of the laws by the government is a lesser evil than the corruption of the legislator, which is an inevitable outcome of particular perspectives. I thought I understood this, but now I'm not sure exactly what he's thinking will go wrong. But the problem is, the problem here is that somehow, like, you get the same people who are making the laws in the same body to then think about a particular case, to, like, discuss a particular case. And somehow that's what's going to be corrupting. I'm not sure I understand that. I guess maybe maybe it's because I'm thinking about enforcing the speeding laws instead of something like giving out privileges or hiring postal workers or whatever, right? Like as soon as you start doing stuff like this, then um, um, we can kind of trade our votes for stuff maybe is what he's worried about. Um, you know, if you convict me of the speeding ticket, I could, I could even go with the speeding ticket. If you convict me of the speeding ticket today, I'm not going to vote for your law tomorrow. <laughs> Maybe that's what he's worried about. I'm not sure. Anyway, um, that's he thinks that democracy in this sense is a bad idea. He also... Um, um, thinks that monarchy is generally not so good, although um, it, de it depends on the circumstances. Um, even, I think, he thinks even something close to democracy might be appropriate in a case where the state is very small and the people are very equal to each other. Um, but so, and, and, you know, and something like, uh, almost like a pure monarchy is going to be appropriate when the state is too big or, you know, some of the people are very powerful relative to others or various other conditions happen. Um, but on the whole, he thinks that monarchy is um, unstable uh, because the single person who is the government is so like, like we're calling this person the king, but they only have authority to enforce the laws made by the by the sovereign. They don't have authority to make any decrees or laws of their own. But um, put them in that position, Rousseau says, and they're going to constantly be tempted to try to take power for themselves and become a master rather than a governor. Um, Plus, there's the issue everyone raises about monarchy, about succession, right? The, like, it's unstable because there's a period when the old monarch is gone and there's, we need a new one. Um, he doesn't seem to be thinking about monarchy that would be elected for a fixed term, right? He seems to be assuming that an elective monarchy would only elect a new king at the, when the old one dies. Um, um, but he he raises some other issues about this which are interesting I'm not going to actually maybe I will read this one 
Um, Because because this actually is is a familiar thing from everyday life. I think um, this is on page two hundred five. He says so. It's this is book three, chapter six, and it's the second paragraph on page two hundred five. Um, However, each revolution in the ministry produces a revolution in the state, since the maxim common to all ministers and nearly all kings is to do the reverse of their predecessor in everything. Right? So he's referring to a fact of human nature or of nature of governments or something that, you know, when new people come in, they want to make their mark by changing the policy. <laughs> and... Um, and, you know, this actually happens. It happens in universities. It happens in states. Um, and, um, and he's saying that monarchy is especially susceptible to this because, again, there's a total change. Right? The old monarch is completely gone and a new one is, is in. Um, so he ends up saying that although, again, it depends on the circumstances, the form of government that's best in itself is aristocracy if it's an elective aristocracy. Um, whereas he says a hereditary aristocracy, that is what we usually call aristocracy, is the worst form of government. <laughs> um, uh, but the best form of government in itself, circumstance, all of these things being equal, something like that, is a hereditary, is an elective aristocracy. So, um, I mean, in a way, an elective aristocracy is kind of close to what we call a representative democracy. Kind of. Right? Like, presumably, every once in a while, everyone gets together and votes for who the new, or the new like, Senate or aristocratic council is going to be. And um, people campaign for it. Right? And he says, you know, this gives an opportunity to choose the best person. We know, we know that doesn't always work that way, but anyway, um, so, uh, um, so it's kind of close to what we call representative democracy. Of course, it's kind of really different because this elected assembly, again, doesn't make any laws. Only the entire assembly of the people can make laws. Um, Okay. Um, is there anything else I want to say about government before I go on? No, I don't think so. Are there, are there questions about government before I go on to my last topic? Well, I should have replaced this with a two. Oops. This was all two. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go on to the third topic, which I described as law and freedom. Um, so the, you know, the basic question, which is, uh, turns out to be surprisingly controversial and hard to answer, is like, what is freedom? What is a free act? Um, remember, we sa saw that Hobbes says that freedom is the absence of impediment. <laughs> so freedom means there's nothing in the way of me doing something. That therefore, I'm free to do it. Um, Locke said, freedom means everyone else is restrained from interfering with me in this respect, right? So it's a little bit more complicated. It's not just that there's no impediment to me doing it. It's there's an impediment to other people interfering with it. That creates this realm in which I have freedom of action. And it's in that sense that Locke said that freedom depends on law. It's not contradictory to law, right? Because don't think of the law, I mean, it does this, of course, but don't think of the law, according to Locke, in this 
connection as, te as telling me what to do. Think of the law as restraining everyone else from interfering with what I do. Without that, I can't really have freedom. Right? I can't be secure and, you know, I can't plan out what I'm going to do and make my own decisions and whatever. Um, Rousseau also connects law with freedom, but the connection is closer and it says, he says something different. So, um, to try to explain where this comes from, I'm going to start with what he says near the beginning of book three. This is on page 191. Um... And right, so here he's describing uh, the action of an ordinary natural person, an individual, and he breaks its cause down into parts. Every free action has two causes that come together to produce it. The one is moral, namely the will that determines the act. The other is physical, namely the power that executes it. So, I mean, this is one of, I haven't really called attention to these before, but this actually comes up pretty often, one of quite a few places where Rousseau sounds close to, to Descartes, to Descartes' dualistic theory of um, free action, you know, which says that, like, the the will, which is a faculty of the soul, which is a separate immaterial substance, somehow like acts on the brain, acts on the pineal gland and like wiggles it around. <laughs> and then um, if the body is in working order, that will make the body move. On the other hand, sometimes the body will wiggle the pineal gland around and will resist the will, <laughs> according to Descartes. Well, I mean, that's just the part of it that Spinoza and other people make fun of. And I think Rousseau is not sufficiently interested in the metaphysical question to tell what he thinks about that. But um, what's important is that um, um, he does think that there are these two factors and you need both of them to have the free action happen. Right? So, um, he gives this example, a paralyzed man who wants to walk or an agile man who does not want to walk will both remain where they are. Oops, I just did that with my cursor. I don't think you see it. A paralyzed man who wants to walk or an agile man who does not want to walk will both remain where they are, right? If either the physical power is out of order, is not, is not working, or the will doesn't give the command, then the action won't happen. That's what a free action is like. Um, Now, I mean, Rousseau already said way back when that, you know, so I guess I should pay, I should write here like, there's the moral cause, which is the will, and there's the physical cause, which is how. So Rousseau already said way back when that a duty can't be created by force, but only by will. This is um, in book one, chapter three on page 159. Talking about this, the alleged right of the strongest. So it's the second paragraph on page 159, the first paragraph of chapter three of book one. I fail to see what, what morality can result from its effects. That is from, or I guess I should have started here. 
Force is a physical power. I fail to see what morality can result from its effects. To give in to force is an act of necessity, not of will. At most, it is an act of prudence. In what sense could it be a duty? Right? So the idea here is something like this, that if the... Um, If the right of the strongest is supposed to mean that I have a duty to obey the strongest, then, um, but, the, but the strongest only acts on me in this respect. That is, they constrain my power. So like in, this, in the literal case, right, the literal chains going back to Hobbes, they constrain my power by literally, you know, putting me in a box or something. Now I want to walk there, but I can't. But Rousseau says that that kind of constraint um, has nothing to do with duty. If the right of the strongest imposed a duty to obey on me, it would have to constrain my will. Right? That is, it would have to make it, in some sense, not um, willable for me to violate the, the command of the strongest. Um, now, I mean, at this point, Hobbes and Locke are... so. So, so are there other questions? Do you see how this, how like moral in both of those places I read from book one and then the other one from the beginning of book three that he's making that same connection between like a moral cause is a will. And, and in book one, in the passage from book one, he's saying, and therefore duty has to constrain my will, not my power. Um... Um, one way to look at it, which to see why you would say this, which is already getting close to Kant, would be to say, I have to want to do it because it's my duty or else I'm not really doing a duty. Right? So again, the fact that it's a duty has to act on my will. If I just happen to do it because of my own um, private interest, then I'm doing, as Kant would say, what's in accord with my duty, but I'm not really doing a duty. Um, I'm just carrying out certain actions that happen to be the same thing that the duty would demand. Okay, so I like something like that, I, th I think, is what Rousseau is already thinking here. Now, Hobbes and Locke, though, are both going to reply two things. First of all, they're going to say, it's vain to suppose a duty that's contrary to necessity. Right? Like, they're both going to agree, look, it's necessary. I'm going to do what is in my own best interest. Um, and if duty is something different than that, then it's um, uh, idle, right? Because no one will ever do it. Um, right, this is the thing in Locke in the essay where he said, you know, it is in vain to give a command to an intelligent being without giving rewards and punishments. Um, that's the only way someone can do something because of your command, because you're going to enforce it with rewards and punishments. Um, so, um, but second of all, uh, Locke and Hobbes will also both say, Right, and by the way, Rousseau, I mean, it's not really physical power that gives the strongest the right to rule over us in a commonwealth. The person who's strongest by virtue of the laws or whatever, it's not literal chains. It's uh, moral chains. It acts on our will by means of promises of rewards or threats of punishments, 
Right, so in particular, when Rousseau says also on page 159, um, back there. So this is at the, towards the end of book one, chapter three. So it's the one, two, three, fourth paragraph on page 159. Obey the powers that be. If that means giving into force, the precept is sound but su superfluous. I reply, it will never be violated. Right. So what Rousseau is thinking here is, right? There's there's no point in telling me you ought to um, comply with force because if it's really force, it will force me to comply. But that's only true if we're talking about literal impediments. <laughs> Right. I mean, what Locke and Hobbes are both going to say is that um, in, in the, the kind of force, political force that forces us to obey, um, it's not impossible to violate it. It's plenty possible. It's just irrational. Because I'm going to get punished. Right. But it's, you know, so it's not at all true that it's in vain to tell you this um, because it will always be obeyed, obeyed. It will only be obeyed by people who follow their reason. And who's telling us this? Well, it's the law of reason. Right. According to both of them. So Rousseau, I think well, it's dangerous to say this. Maybe I don't understand Rousseau as well as I should. Oops, I see there's only two minutes left. Um, maybe I'll say more about this next time, I guess. But I think what um, Rousseau really means to say um, is that true duty involves the will determining itself according to its own principles without referring to external incentives. Um, right, and Rousseau says something like this. I'll come back to this next time, I guess. But um, in Book One, Chapter Eight, he says, um, wait, "Where is this? Yeah, it's on page one sixty-seven. For to be driven by appetite alone is slavery. Slavery." And obedience to, obedience to the law one has prescribed for oneself is liberty. Right? So the connection between law and freedom is that as long as I'm just driven by things that I want, by particular objects that attract or repel me, I'm actually a slave to my own appetites. I'm not free. And freedom is to give myself a law. That's what he's saying in uh, Book One, Chapter Eight, on page one sixty-seven. So, right, this is what Kant calls autonomy, where this part auto means self, and this part namos means law. Freedom is autonomy; that is, being subject only to a law that you've given yourself. Now, obviously, this has some connection to what Rousseau is saying about politics, but I'll try to to say something about that next time. And uh, I will see you then. Bye.